Democrats never want to cut anything. The state budget is tens of billions of dollars. Is there anything in the state budget that you would propose that? I'm, I'm, I think that's an unfair stereotype of Democrats, because we, we've seen at the national level and the state level that, that, that Democrats do have sensible economic policies. I mean, we look at Bill Clinton, we look at Governor Rendell, and I would like to bring that sort of common sense thinking to the, the state of Pennsylvania's legislature. And I mean, hopefully in two years, we bring it to the governor's office as well. Are there things I cut? Uh, of course. Um, I mean, not only in terms of cutting programs, but closing tax loopholes, like, like the Delaware Corporation loophole, that make sure that we get revenue that we deserve. So that's not so much a cut as it is a, a you know, a, a, a revenue saver. Beyond that, we only need to look at our state house and our state senate to see things that we need to cut. The average state house member makes $81,000 a year. They have pensions. They have lifetime health care after three terms in office. This is outrageous when so many people in Pennsylvania are going without any sort of benefit comparable to that. So is there a large savings there? No. But if, if, if Harrisburg is going to say, we need to cut, we need to cut schools, we need to cut uh, you know, basic education, we need to make cuts in infrastructure and highway repair and bridge repair, I say we, we cut Harrisburg's pay. We, we implement term limits, we, and, and I know this isn't going to pass, and, and I'm not going to, you know, claim that there's any way Harrisburg's going to going to vote for, for its own pay decrease. But if we draw attention to the issue, if people actually know how much other legislatures are being paid, that we have the second biggest legislature in the country and one of the most expensive, I think it's going to become an issue that is too big for uh, Harrisburg to ignore. Thank you. Well, agree. We, could, we could cut some in Harrisburg, but the size of the legislature could be cut. There are 203 House members. That could be 133 tomorrow. Take a third off tomorrow. And we'd be better off for it, I believe. Right now, each house represents about, Joe's the numbers guy, about 62,000 residents. That could be 100,000. We're not traveling by horse and buggy. We, we, we could get around and then handle that. So we could have a small legislature. One specific area we could cut? Prisons. I, I work in the criminal justice system. I've, I've lost count of the people I've seen, the drug addicts, the simple small-time dealers who sell $10 worth of something, go off to state prison for two to four years under the mandatory minimum sentences. They're crazy. And every politician I've ever heard talk about it, Republicans and Dems, say the same thing. We're such a conservative state, you'll never change that. And that just doesn't sit with me. I can't, A, there's nothing conservative about wasting money, and B, Virginia, Texas, Arizona, conservative states have gotten smart on crime and cut their prison costs. We can do it too. We're approaching two billion a year on prison costs, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That's obscene, it's wasteful, and it absolutely can be changed. And I'm not saying open the gates, but nonviolent offenders don't need to be sitting in state prison. That's a terrible waste of money. Bill? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, this leads right into that, uh, so to follow up question to the end of that. And how can we cut spending on the prison system and still be tough on crime? Well, tough on crime is a great catchphrase for politicians. I call them tougher than thou, tougher than thou legislators. <laughs> well, you've got a good law, I'll show you. And we take, we've taken the sentencing power away from judges and put it in the hands of DAs and the legislatures, these mandatory minimums, they're, they're crazy. Poor judges are, are, have little to do with so many of these cases. So one way would be to get rid of these mandatory minimum sentences for, for nonviolent offenders, let judges do this. And secondly, especially when people have low drug problems, every study, every study from the Heritage Foundation, conservative groups, liberal groups, they all say rehabilitation is more effective, more cost effective, and better, it produces better results than does incarceration when you're dealing with recidivism and drug addiction. So we can lock them up for two years, spend $100,000 doing it, or we can get them into a drug rehab program a lot cheaper. We could save a lot of money, I think, have a much, but we'd be safer because a lot of these folks go off to state prison where they learn how to become better criminals. That's what happens. I think we could change that out. So that's a specific. 
Well, I hope our group feel that we need to do more to put power in the hands of local judges to pass down sentences that they see fit. So I agree, Bill. Uh, you know, mandatory sentencing is, is something we need to look at in terms of prison reform. I strongly disagree, though, that drug dealers are nonviolent offenders. And so I have every bit of sympathy for drug addicts, for people who cannot control their habits, for people who are in, in some way forced into a life of crime to support a drug habit that's out of control. And I will do everything in my power to, to seek programs that get them in rehabilitation that have them become productive members of society again. But to say that somebody who's pushing drugs and pushing drugs in our communities and pushing drugs to our children is a nonviolent offender and deserves rehab instead of prison is something I can't stand for. And I stand, but, but I, I, I still stand. So. Uh, we have a number of different questions about taxes. So I'm just going to ask a generic question about taxes. You, you can include property taxes in there as a, as a component of that. But, I don't think it's an overstatement to say Pennsylvania's, Pennsylvania's tax system is probably the most convoluted in the nation. Yes, it is. Uh, what would you do to reform that? Well, I think mean, there are a good number of things we can look at in, in terms of uh, tax reform at the state level. I mean, among other things, the property tax situation is out of control, but, but for reasons that are, are not immediately apparent, we have an administration that's committed to cutting basic education. When they cut basic education, that leads to property tax increases at home because the school districts need to make up that revenue somewhere. So if the state's doing its part, we're going to see our property taxes come down. Beyond that, I, I, I am in favor of amending the state income tax to become a progressive system. I don't want to see an increase in the state income tax for most Pennsylvanians. I, I think a lot of us are in agreement about that. But if, if we do go to a progressive system, for those who make a little bit more than, than the average Pennsylvanian, I think they should be paying a little bit more than their average uh, than their average share. Beyond that, we have numerous loopholes that we can close uh, in regard with the state sales tax. Oh my goodness. Uh, with, with the state sales tax, uh, I, I would do away with the 1% refund that we give for businesses who pay their sales tax on time. I don't want to reward somebody for doing something uh, that sh they should be doing anyway. And I would look into, um, beyond that, perhaps, uh, oh golly, I had something good to say. Um, but again, we, 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 need to, we need to focus on tax reform, but we need to make sure that the tax burden on the average Pennsylvanian remains uh, manageable. We need a fairer system. Of course, that's an easy phrase to throw out there. I would propose, and I would support efforts to eliminate the school property tax. And it has to be replaced with something. So some taxes would have to go up. This is the real world. The sales tax would have to go up. The income tax would have to go up. I do support a progressive income tax rate. And of course, we close that Delaware loophole. That's just thrown around a lot. The estimate I saw says $600 million a year could be brought into the, the, the uh, Pennsylvania budget, if we, if corporations that do business here would pay taxes here and avoid that Delaware loophole. But the property tax, it just seems, it, it's the reason that school board member has got the most thankless job in the world, because it's a lousy system. When here in Kutztown we need a new school, we need a $35 million school, and the local taxpayers say, but I can't afford to stay in my home if we raise taxes anymore. It's a horrible system that has to be changed. So I've eliminated the school property tax, replace it, as I said, increased sales tax, increased income tax, close the Delaware loophole. In general, there's too much is done with the tax code at the federal level and the state level with exceptions and loopholes and wisdom. Simpler is better when it comes to that. Let people know what's being taxed, tax everybody, and cut out all the special interest and all the money that gets tossed around with lobbyists and whatnot. It just makes things convoluted. And then the average person says, this is an unfair system, and starts to cheat. And then I think it would be better if we simply kept it simple and unfair. And once again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've seen, uh, starting in Wisconsin and throughout the, the nation, that there have been attacks on collective bargaining rights and on unions in general. Uh, where do you stand on collective bargaining rights, and what would you do to protect union uh, membership rights? We absolutely need collective bargaining rights and the attack in Wisconsin and other places is preposterous. 
the notion that all of our problems can be cured if we simply beat up on teachers and firemen. It's ridiculous. People need to come together and be allowed to bargain together. Unions are strong. Prevailing wage is an important issue. We're not going to join the race to the bottom by cutting wages and cutting, and well, we can do it lower, we can do it cheaper. I, I was a member of a union when I got a job down here at the foundry. Back then we made a whopping 440 an hour. But the fact that there was a union meant we had a safe working condition, we had safe working conditions, and if there was a problem, there was somebody on that floor I could talk to other than the boss about it. So very strong pro-union, pro-collective bargaining rights, all these notions that come along and that to strike that down, they're nonsense, I vote against them, of course. Well, as somebody who actually worked in the Wisconsin State Senate recall elections, I've seen firsthand the damage that the Walker administration did out there uh, by re or attempting to remove uh, public sector collective bargaining rights, and I will do my damnedest to make sure that the Corbett administration here has no such luck in Pennsylvania, because public unions and, 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 and unions uh, you know, in industry and, and across the state are have, have, have had such a tremendous impact on our economy, on building the America that not only we have, but the America that we want uh, in terms of protecting worker rights, in terms of ensuring safe working conditions, ensuring fair pay, and to say we're going to do away with this because we're we're in some economic turmoil, I I will fiercely oppose that. One thing I want to say about the previous question, though, in terms of getting rid of the property tax, I think this is dangerous. And I know nobody likes the property tax, but to give that much power to Harrisburg to allocate every school district's funding to remove taxation the taxation rights of school boards permanently is incredibly risky. We don't trust the Corbett administration on, on women's productive issues. We don't uh, trust the Corbett administration on environmental issues. We don't trust them on, on criminal law issues. Why are we going to trust them with education when their track record has been cutting, cutting, cutting? I'm going to stand up. <laughs> I told you to become a habit eventually. Uh, we're getting down to uh, just my questions. So if you have uh, uh, blue cards and you have questions and you haven't turned them in yet, please turn them in. Uh, Dick will uh, uh, bring them up here. Um, and I'm waiting for one. Uh, we haven't had any question about something that begins with F and has CK in it. <laughs> Is this it? Not yet. Okay. Um, so, so let's jump into the, the next question. Uh, a major segment of our population still is without equal civil rights. Uh, it's illegal to discriminate against uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people in Pennsylvania. Uh, they have no civil rights. It's, it's, uh, there's nothing in uh, Pennsylvania law that protects. Uh, uh, is, uh, there, there's no anti-discrimination law. But there's also no marriage equality. Do you support equal civil rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender people? Well, Mike, of course I do. Uh, I mean, not only am I endorsed by Paul Rick one of the largest gay and lesbian and transgender uh, groups in, in Pennsylvania, but this is an issue I believe strongly in. And I, I know we've done a lot of good work across the state, passing local ordinances and local laws and about you know, removing companies' rights to discriminate or perceived rights to discriminate against people who are gay, lesbian, or transgender. We need to do that at the state level. And you know, I'm going to fight to make sure that discrimination ends statewide. And I'm going to fight for marriage equality once I get to Harrisburg. And, and again, I know that's an issue that may be tough for some Pennsylvanians to accept. I, I, I know that you know, we're, it's about 50-50 support. I know we've had some success across the nation, but it's the right thing to do, and that's why I'll be fighting for it. I support both, whether you call it the libertarian leaning that says the government doesn't have any business telling people how to live, or whether you call it the live and let live philosophy. People are people here. We should all have the same rights. And I don't want to hear government saying, well, you have this right and you don't have the same one. Nonsense. Of course I do. Of course I support those things. I think you're going to find that Joe and I agree on a whole lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. I mean, we're, we're, I, th I think we're both Democrats, though. <laughs> we're all on the same team. You know, we're just trying to figure out who's 
this year's lineup. <laughs> um, here's a, I like this question. Uh, what is your new idea that nobody else is talking about? Ah. No one, no politician that I've seen is, is willing to talk about the prison reform issue because they're all afraid of it. I'm going to put it right up front because I think that the voters are a lot smarter than these politicians give us credit for. When I say that prison costs are crazy high and we need to do something about it and they run for cover, I'm, people I talk to say, yeah, that makes sense. And this will get me back to that question. I mentioned uh, nonviolent offenders and whether the drug dealer is a nonviolent offender. The ones I see, the ones I'm talking about, are the, the addicts, the person who gets caught selling $20 worth of something in a, in a so-called school zone. Under these mandatory minimum sentence laws, a school zone is a thousand feet from a school as the crow flies, not as the school child walks. So it's a big circle around every school and it's 24-7 in the middle of the summer. So the kid who gets caught, and I'll say, pick a kid, the 19-year-old kid who's addicted to something and sells $10 worth of heroin or something like that on a Saturday night in the summer, 3 a.m., no school in session, they are facing a mandatory two to four years in state prison. That's what I'm talking about. And most politicians won't talk about that. So I guess that's new that I'm willing to say that. I may get crucified for it, but I, I gotta tell you what I think. So there's, there's the one idea. Stick with that. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Well, so after coming out in favor of uh, gay marriage and, and, and marriage for, for all Pennsylvanians, I don't know what, uh, what big, bold idea I could top that with. I, I think the big, bold idea we need for this district for 187 is winning. We have not had a candidate win here since 1982. We've come close uh, two of the last three elections. 2006, Archie, Archie Bullweiler ran, did a tremendous job, came within 400 votes of winning. 2008, John Ritter, who could not be here tonight. John's a good friend of mine, John's a supporter. He, he worked his ass off as best he could. Uh, he was suffering from leukemia, as many of you know. Uh, came within 4% of winning. And, you know, I think we've gone too long without Democratic representation. We need somebody who's going to get out there and work. And I've been working every day since I announced my candidacy in January. And that means getting out, getting on doors, talking to voters face to face. And this can be three, four, five hours a day. As Sundays, you know, Saturdays, Sundays, sometimes seven hours. Uh, but I like doing it. I like hearing from people in the district. The responses are great. They need to know that somebody's out fighting for them, and if they know that, they'll get out and vote, and we're going to have a Democrat in this district again. Uh, if you want to find out what the right wing is thinking uh, in Pennsylvania, go to the, Heri uh, the uh, Commonwealth Foundation's website. Uh, I don't recommend that as regular reading, but uh, <laughs> if you do want to find out what their agenda is and what things are going to be introduced in the General Assembly, that's a good place to look. Uh, privatization is a big issue. Uh, there's discussion right now about privatizing the lottery. We've heard about privatizing the wine and spirit shops. Mm -hmm. Vouchers have been called a way to privatize schools. Uh, Governor Corbett has proposed privatizing the state parks. Uh, and if you go to the Heritage Foundation, I mean the Commonwealth Foundation's website, uh, they're talking about privatizing the state colleges and universities. How do you feel about privatization? I, I strongly oppose it. And it, it only shows us how far out of touch the Corbett administration and people like Gary Day actually are. Uh, the proposal to privatize the lottery serves no purpose. It's going to deprive us of revenue. It's not going to, to, to help senior citizens in any way, but it's a quick cash grab. It's a way of getting government out of one more element of life that, that for some reason, Republicans feel that we should have no government at all. Um, we see this with, with education, and, and Mike, as you mentioned, of course, the, the efforts to diminish our public university system to the point that it, it is no longer solvent, to, 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 to reduce the quality, to, to, to make privatization an inevitability, that we have no choice but to privatize. And we see this at the, at the basic education level as well. Republicans cut spending for public education so they can privatize. Privatization is not the solution, it's just one more step to diminishing government's ability to deliver essential services. The services that we want it delivering, you know, again, going back to, to House Bill 1077, they can dictate medical policy, but they don't want to educate our children. And so we, we, we have a radically 
uh, different perspective on government from from the Corbyn administration, uh, and I don't support anything that leads to the undermining of our public schools, our public parks, our lottery system, our state stores, our state stores where we have good jobs, uh, where we turn a profit, where we generate revenue for the state itself. If we sell these stores, we're not even going to make up in that one-time sale the revenue that they generate each and every year. It's a sh in the short term, it's idiotic. In the long term, it's even worse. Don't favor privatizing the schools. Don't the or the lottery, for instance. Because why take profit from a system like that and give it to someone else? Why not? You know, if we're going to make money for the state. Let's keep it. I'm going to disagree on the liquor stores. I don't understand why we're in the business of selling liquor. Regulation of liquor, absolutely. That's a government function. Selling of liquor, why? You know, we've been around the country enough that there's some. The laws vary from state to state. I lived in Utah for a while. There's some wacky with the laws, but give ours a run for their money. I've in Texas where there's some spots where the road is wide open and it's so hot and so flat that they pick you up if you're not drinking a beer while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to be in that business. But in general, privatization is often a, an excuse to shrink and attack a program that some people don't like. And I would be really worried about that. I got my F blank CK uh, card. <laughs> Excuse me, Mike, it is 745, so okay. probably about the last question. All right. So we have to ask this one. Uh, I have a number of them, and uh, so I'm just going to ask one with the most words. Uh, fracking is a huge issue in PA. What is your opinion on fracking, and what is your opinion on other forms of energy? Okay. Other forms of energy, we have to switch over to renewables. We're going to transition from fossil fuels to renewables. We can do it smart, we can start creating more jobs, we can support people putting solar panels on their roofs by, by credits that the government of Pennsylvania just stopped. They ran out of money. We can do more to support the transition, that's where we're going. Fracking, it's a misleading term. This is unconventional gas drilling. But fracking is just the explosion. But what they're doing now in this unconventional system is they're going two, two miles deep sending out horizontal drills all over the area, fracking major issues. It's not just the fracking, it's the fact that you've got these horizontal wells, the fact that you've got what's called slick water. Water mixed with sand, mixed with 600 chemicals, many of which are nasty, nasty chemicals, putting down through the water supply. And they tell you, well, most of it's going to come back up and we're going to treat it, or they're having no luck treating it. And then most of it, the other half of it or so will all stay in the ground. Don't worry, it'll be safe down there. It won't come back. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I tell you, if, if I told you that Al Qaeda was dumping 600 nasty chemicals through the water supply, we'd have the black helicopters flying over. We'd be up in arms. I tell you, Halliburton is doing it, and it's oh yeah, that's what Halliburton does. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a horrible idea. We need a moratorium on it. I believe a ban is appropriate. What we see now is just the opposite, this Wild West boom time mentality. I believe a reasonable compromise is, is a, a moratorium. If I'm wrong and it can be done safe, the gas will still be there. If the other side is wrong and it can't be done safe, then we're going to ruin our environment. And 10 years from now, look up and say, wow, what happened? So uh, I thought I'd be doing a moratorium on fracking. Well, can you repeat the question? Because I know it was lengthy. It was. Now I find it. <laughs> yes. just about fracking. And, and alternate en energy, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm struggling in favor of alternate energy programs. I don't know if they should be originating at the state level. Uh, because if we're subsidizing somebody who's using solar panels or converting to wind power or anything of, of, of that nature, that's mostly the spur industry. And I don't know if at the state level that would have enough of an effect to make it worthwhile, that it actually leads to improvements in the industry. Now, I support federal programs that do that, but I, I don't know if it actually offers us the benefit at the state level to commit to uh, heavily subsidizing those industries. As for fracking, um, I don't think anybody on the Democratic side likes fracking. I think, unfortunately, it's here to stay. We have too much gas in Pennsylvania to keep these companies out. 
And what we need to do is make sure that the impact fees are significant. We need a strong severance tax. I mean, currently they're paying 2.6% in taxes, one of the lowest rates in the country. And that, that's outrageous. And then to have that locked in for 15 years, e even more so. And I, I think we got a bum deal uh, from people uh, on both sides of the aisle. That said, it's not going away. We need people who fight to make sure that we get the revenue, that we get the oversight that we need, that it's regulated, that it's as safe as we can make it, and that Pennsylvania, all Pennsylvanians will profit from this, not just the energy companies. So it's, it's time for... 748. It's time for closing statements. Oh, again, I just want to thank everybody for, for coming out tonight. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see in a town the size of Kutztown how many people are involved. And then we need to make sure that translates into involvement on April 24th. And of course, getting out and voting on November 6th as well, because that's something we, we, we don't always do right. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody who, I'll, I'll admit it, I, I've missed a few elections myself. You know, I said, oh, I'm busy. I, I don't know the candidates. I don't feel, feel right voting. And that's what's led to us having a, a district that for 30 years has been Republican. And, and not just, you know, middle of the road Republican. Some of the most conservative Republicans we can think of, Gary Day is far, far to the right. He's far to the right of this district. And yet we've been stuck with him for four years. We need to do more. We need a candidate who's willing to fully commit himself to seeking this office. Somebody who has the capacity to not only get out there, conduct a professional campaign, but to raise the money that we need uh, to compete. I mean, we've got over $2,000 of contribution so far. I'm targeted to, to raise about $35,000 for this campaign. You know, once we get the state party involved and everything else, we're going to have an 80 to $90,000 campaign that makes sure, you know, 2008 Gary Day said day in. 2010, 12, we're gonna make sure we say day out. <laughs> I'm hoping Joe will help me raise money later on. Go ahead for you. And I would, of course, help him because we are on the same team. And Gary Day has to go. Gary votes like all Republicans in Harrisburg do. They all vote in lockstep, on the lockstep legislators. Tom Corbett comes up with some crazy new idea. He's going to fix a voter ID problem that no one knew we had, and they vote with him in lockstep. That's got to go. To be honest with you, I'm not going to vote lockstep with the Democrats either, and I'll tell you right now, that's, and they may piss some people off, excuse my French, but there's just, there's no way. But it's set up in Harrisburg, it seems like you go down there and you serve the party, then the party rewards you, Dems and Republicans. No, I, I, I don't believe it. For too often, for too long now, we've seen the, the extremes defining the debate. And I really believe that most Pennsylvanians are somewhere in the middle, and we can find compromise. We can find ways to work out our problems. If we disagree on an issue, it doesn't make us enemies. Civil people can disagree civilly. I believe we can work things out and solve a lot of our problems through civil discourse. I believe I've spent the past 20 some years in the legal profession doing just that, working things out. And that's what I think I'd be a good candidate for this, this position. I hope we do it. We need to do it as Dems. We need to do it regardless of who, who wins. We, we need to do it because it's really important. We've got to change things up down in Harrisburg.